Great, thanks. Okay, so I was taught, asked to talk about um, timescales in land data assimilation, which I'm going to do in a fair, fairly narrow context by talking about soil moisture data assimilation. Um, and I'm going to present results from two studies, both of which I did a little while ago. So the background to this is that typically in land data assimilation, the observations that we're assimilating are taken quite close to the surface and so often have a faster time scale than the land model variables that we're most interested in. So the example I'm looking at here is assimilating surface soil moisture to constrain root zone soil moisture. And this raises a question, um, which model timescales benefit from assimilating the faster surface soil moisture observations and can we do anything to manipulate the observations to improve the analysis at slower at the slower states. And so what I'm thinking a little bit about here is a bunch of papers that have come out mostly from the University of Washington showing that you can improve the assimilation of faster states to constrain slower states by assimilating time averaged observations. However, I should point out straight off the bat that with the exception of that first paper, Huntley and Hakim, all of these papers are focused on um, paleoclimate or ocean models where they're interested in decadal timescales and they're taking things like uh, yearly averages. The first paper though, they're looking at assimilating and showing that there's benefit to assimilating weekly or monthly averages of atmospheric observations into a, um, a model of flow over a mountain. Okay. So the first of the studies that is one that Rolf and I did in 2015. Um, so we assimilated nine years of AMSORI surface soil moisture observations into the catchment model. We did this at four sites where the USDA maintains a network of very, um, very dense surface soil moisture observations so that we can get a confident estimate of the grid scale surface soil moisture, which we can directly compare um, to our model estimates. And then when we did this assimilation, I decomposed all of the relevant time series into different time scales. Um, so the first was I called long, this is the interannual variability. The second I called seasonal, that's my mean seasonal cycle. And then the third is short. So this is anything that was sub-seasonal. And then I in estimated the impact of the data assimilation on the unbiased mean square error against the ground observations at each of these time scales. So before I show the assimilation results, I just wanna have a quick look at the catchment and ancillary Observa observations. So what I've plotted here on the right is the fraction of variance in each of the timescales, the four clusters of plots are the four different locations. Um, and we're interested in looking at the leftmost uh, set, two sets of bars. So that the leftmost bar is the model open loop, and then the next one across is the ancillary observations. With the dark gray being my, the fraction of variance in the short timescales, the light gray being seasonal and the white being long. So you see straight away, if you compare the model and the observations that there's quite, a lot of difference in the fraction of variance that they have in each time scale. Um, in general, I might expect, particularly given that AMSRI is a C-band sensor, I might expect it to have more variability in the short time scales. Um, this, you see this result in the first two um, locations. You don't see it at the second locations, but what's going on there, particularly at Little River on the far right, is if you plot out the time series, you can see that AMSRI has a a very exaggerated seasonal cycle that's not evident in the ground observations at all. So I think what's going on there is that you've got this spurious seasonal cycle that's sort of taking up a lot of, of the variance. As a slight aside from this, I want to reiterate a point that Sujay made in a different form on Monday, is that in a case like this, say where we've got a spurious seasonal cycle or, or some sort of error, large error in one of our timescales, if we do a bulk rescaling of all of the, of the observations into the model, say by CDF matching prior to the assimilation, that error in one time scale is then going to is then going to affect the rescaling of the other of the other time scales. And so I think from this it might be worth thinking about separating out time scales when we do the rescaling, which is exactly what's done in the SMAP level four project product. They take out the mean seasonal cycle before they do the the rescaling. Um, yeah. So moving on to look at the assimilation results. So here I'm showing again each of the four bars, each of the four. Um, panels is my different locations. The metric here is the unbiased mean square error. And we're only interested in the leftmost two bars. So the leftmost is my model open loop. And then the next one across is a standard assimilation experiment. You see the result that we would expect is that the assimilation reduces the errors um, at each of my locations. Um, if you look at the individual time series, uh, sorry, time scales, what you'll see is that um, it also reduces the error in each of the time scales and the reduction of error in the long and short time scales is about the same magnitude, um, which is represents a much larger relative reduction in the, in the longer time scales. 
I think th this was a promising result. I wasn't sure that we'd get this. Um, and what it shows is that the DA can not just improve the representation of, of sub-seasonal events like um, errors related with individual synoptic events. It can also improve the model representation of interannual events like things like things like drought. So this is quite a promising result. And then I put in just another sort of aside here is one of the consequences of this is that if you have an evaluation method that doesn't catch interannual variability, for example, because you've only done your assimilation over a one year time period, or because um, you're using, you're focusing on anomalies, you might not be capturing all of the improvement that you get from your assimilation. Okay, so after, a couple of years after I did this, I changed jobs, I moved to NOAA, and then while I was waiting for my um, computer clearance to come through, I coded up a little toy uh, DA system on my laptop and just used it to sort of uh, play with a few things I've been curious about. And one of the things I looked at was, was some of these questions around um, assimilating fast uh, timescale observations to update slow states. Um, the results that I got from this are all actually fairly, ob all sort of fit with the theory. Um, but it was useful for me to sort of go through the through the process of demonstrating that to myself. So I thought I'd show you some of these results today as well. So my little toy study, it's just a simple force restore soil moisture model that models soil moisture in the surface layer, layer one, and then it's got a layer two, which is actually the profile soil moisture. Um, I'm assimilating the surface soil moisture observations to update the, the full profile. I'm using an ensemble square, square root come and filter. And then I'm going to evaluate the impact at the two different timescales. So I've defined these differently than in the previous study. I've set a slow time scale, which represents the seasonal cycle and then longer um, time scale variability and, and then a fast time scale, which is the sub seasonal. I've run a series of synthetic experiments that I'll show today. So for these experiments, I generate the truth by forcing my model with observations. Addis is at a location in the US. I then generate my synthetic observations by adding random perturbations to the truth. Um, and those perturbations might be at fast or slow timescales. I then generate my model by forcing the force restore model with mirror output instead of the observations, the USCRN observations. A note here is that when I looked at this, about 70% of the variant of the error variance in my model run is in the slow time scales, which is probably a little bit too much. Um, in the AMSRE study, um, we had about 50% of the variance, error variance and catchment was in the slow time scales. For the assimilation, for the results I'm going to show you today, I specify my observation error to have the same magnitude as the model error in the surface soil moisture. Um, I create the ensemble by adding perturbations to the precipitation and evaporation that are that are represented of the errors that I know are in each. Um, that's probably all I need to say on that. Okay, so moving on to look at the results. So the first thing I did is I looked at the time scales of observation errors. Let me check the time. Okay. Um, and what I, so the first thing I did was I looked at what happens when we add fast time scale error. So this is just adding Gaussian noise with no serial correlation. And in this instance, the DA performs very well, even if we add a very large amount of, of error, which, you know, we, which we would expect. And so this already answers that question that I think assimilating fast state variables with fast errors to update a slow state doesn't appear to be particularly problematic, at least for the time scales that I'm dealing with here. In a second set of experiments, I then added slow timescale errors to the data assimilate to the to the observations. And in this case, the data assimilation was much less robust to that. And again, we would expect that because by adding errors with slow timescales, I'm adding areas with, with a long serial correlation. I'm essentially adding observation bias, um, which we know that the DA can't can't handle unless we've explicitly designed it to. And so I've tried to um, summarize these two plots in these, these two experiments in another set of experiments, which I show here. So the plot on the left is the root mean square error in layer one, the plot on the right is in layer two. The black line is my model run, the red line is my assimilation. Solid line is the total root mean square error, dash line is the root mean square error in the slow time scales, and then the dotted is in the fast time scales. Um, the leftmost point that I plotted is my ensemble open loop. So if you compare that to the model, you'll notice, particularly in layer two, that we're just getting some improvement in performance from using an ensemble. Then as the numbers increase from zero to one, that's basically the fraction of the error variance that's in the slow time scales. And so you see that when we've got zero in the slow time scale, so it's all fast, 
police just pulled out that front. Uh, it's all fast. The data assimilation performs really well. Um, if you've got 100% of that, so the rightmost plot, you see the data assimilation is not performing well at all. And in fact, once we've got about more than about 30% of our variance in the slow time scales, the data assimilation um, starts to um, degrade. Okay, so moving on to look at assimilation of time averaged observations. So here I followed the method laid out by Huntley and Hakim. Basically, you're just taking a time average of observations, assimilating them at the end of the averaging time period and using them to update the model average over that time period. And, and then you just sort of add in the, the um, perturbation from that average back, back into the model. So what I'm showing here is a plot, a plots again, layer one, layer two, leftmost is the open loop. Um, Averaging time period of one is just your standard assimilation, and then I increase the averaging time period up to 60 across the x-axis. And so you see, basically, if we, if we look at layer two, that assimilating a time average observation doesn't help. Um, and, and we would expect this if we think about the theory. The ensemble common filter is a more efficient filter than taking a time average. Um, and then the other thing you see is in the top layer is that the assimilating the time average actually degrades um, the, the assimilation performance. Again, we would expect this, we're removing a lot of the fast um, variability that's actually useful at that time scale. Okay, next up, I repeated that experiment. So I should have said in the, in the results I just showed you, I had 5% of my error variance in the slow time scales in the observations. I then increased it to 20% in the middle plot here, which is about what we had in the um, AMPS3 study I showed you earlier. And then I've increased it to 40%, which was an example where the assimilation was actually degrading the performance. Um, and so you see, looking at the bottom row, maybe we're getting a little bit more of an advantage by taking the time average once we've got um, sort of a less ideal assimilation. Um, but at the same time, we're still not actually producing an assimilation here that helps. I would argue in this case where you've got 40% of your error variance and the observations in long time scales is that you should be looking at fixing your observations rather than trying to contrive a way to, uh, to make them work. Yeah, I think that's all I had to say from that slide. Okay, and then just one final result, one final slide of results is I repeated these experiments and instead of assimilating the time average, I just time sampled the observations. So it, so what you show, you're seeing on these plots, so the left plot is assimilating the time average, the right set plots are assimilating time sampled. So um, where you've got 20 on the left, I'm assimilating an average uh, over the 20 day time period. Whereas in the right plot, I'm just assimilating the observations every 20, in, every 20 days. And the reason I included this is just to highlight is that any um, changes that we're getting from the assimilation of the time average, we're just getting actually, it, are associated with the change in frequency of the assimilation. Um, and this is in contrast to the previous studies I mentioned where the advantage that they get from assimilating time averaged observations is actually that it increases the error covariances because you calculate the error covariances between your time average variables instead of your instantaneous variables. So in summary, modeled and remotely sensed surface soil moisture estimates have differing distribution of variance across different time scales, which means that there must be time scale specific errors present. Um, the assimilation of remotely sensed so almost a corrected model at interannual and subseasonal timescales. And again, I thought this was a promising result. I wasn't sure that we'd actually get that interannual improvement. Um, my synthetic study demonstrates that assimilating faster timescale OBS to update lowest, the slower states is not particularly problematic for soil moisture data assimilation. Um, However, you know, perhaps there are examples in land DA where you've got a much larger contrast between your timescales where, where maybe it is more problematic and you might want to look at, at, at other solutions. The assimilation of observations with slow or systematic errors, on the other hand, is problematic. I tried to think sort of how relevant this, this result would be to land data assimilation um, and sort of what sorts of things might add in this sort of error. And, and I think, you know, there the probably, probably is an issue. Things like sensor drift or errors in the vegetation and temperature that you're using in a soil moisture retrieval, for example, could do this. Um, and I think this might be another argument for removing the mean seasonal cycle from um, your DA, say by doing the DA on anomalies from the mean seasonal cycle, like, like what's done in SMAP level four. A result I didn't show is that if you assimilate the fast time scales and update only the slow time scales, this becomes problematic as well. Um, I didn't show this because I'm not sure how relevant this is to land data assimilation. Perhaps if you were assimilating atmospheric observations into, into a, a land model, maybe maybe you might, might see a result like this, I'm not sure. Um, in both the above cases, assimilating the time average observations marginally improved the slow timescale model variable while degrading the fast timescale. 
And I said improvements, perhaps I should have said changes are associated with less frequent data assimilation. Again, this is in contrast to those previous papers. And then finally, I've just sort of added a caveat on this, um, particularly if, if that, you know, the, the force restore model has a, a very particular design. Um, and, the, and I'm just running a single test case. At the same time, these results all sort of theoretically make sense. So, so I trust them. And that's all, thank you.